Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. Okay, so this is fun now. So I've been looking forward to this one for a while. So welcome to the series finale of Church History. Uh, of, course, of course, that's not working straight away. All right, so, um, so as you remember, we touched on the... Well, it's, you know, actually, let's go this way back. We've touched on all, all of church history. Um, we've um, kind of a, taken a whistle-stop tour, picked out bits and pieces. I've not been able to look at all the piece, all the people that I would have liked. Um, Joan of Arc, a great character which I would have loved to have looked at. Um, Michael Zavertus, a guy in the 1300s, 1400s, a oneness believer who chose to face death rather than recant his beliefs. Uh, two guys named William in the 19th century, one who was a soap salesman who trusted God so much that he tied 50% of his income. <clears throat> and God blessed him so, um, effectively with a really successful company. And William Colgate's company still exists today. So next time you're brushing your teeth, you thank God for those pearly whites. <laughs> and those, and the, uh, the other key, William, in the 19th century, um, a churchgoer born in uh, St. Anthony in Nottingham. Nottingham always popping up within church history. And he arranged his congregation like an army to deliver the salvation message. Rena, who am I talking about? William Booth, uh, founder of the Salvation Army. So before I touch on the uh, 20th century, oh, there's Kerry. You missed the St. Anthony uh, Nottingham reference. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so before I touch on the 20th century, it's actually necessary for, for us to go right back to the beginning, um, take a look at where we'd uh, come, from, come through as a church. So uh, there we go. So we'd looked at the formation of the New Testament. It had been collated using letters from Paul and Peter, using eyewitness accounts to uh, formulate the Holy Scriptures that we still have in use today. We, and then, despite persecution, the church endured, and eventually church and state became married, intertwined, um, through uh, Emperor Constantine and the Council of Nicaea, the start of when the church started to adopt creeds and doctrines and actually either putting them on par or even elevating them above uh, scripture which negatively affected uh, the church for the next thousand years um, until eventually when clickers stop there we go. I promise you this is on uh, can you just move the sorry, there we go um, and then Eventually, we saw inventions such as the uh, Gutenberg Press, which had a positive impact on the church in general. During that thousand-year period, that law, the scriptures, which had been designed for everyone to be able to read, they were locked away, hidden, um, accessed by only the elites and uh, the upper echelons. But, the, but then the Gutenberg Press, it allowed the Bible to be printed en masse, and also enabled the, um, enabled the Reformation movement to be able to move forward in a positive way. So we had Martin Luther being able to publish his tracts to get um, people on board with his notions. And then we also had Ulrich Zwingli and uh, John Calvin, prominent members within the, prominent members within the uh, church movements to wrest control away from the Catholic Church moving away from political ideologies. Um, you know, people, you know, they would seek political power with them using the church, and they rested it, trying to bring it back to the people. Um, we'd also seen how the works of Martin Luther, they'd been used to encourage um, great evils, but yet also inspired effective goods. Use it with um, their, their break from the Catholic Church, we saw how figures such as um, Henry VIII, Mary Queen of Scots, how the Church of England had developed as a result. Denominations started to come into play. We had the Puritans, the Pilgrims, the Separatists, um, all desiring to bring the church back to how it should be. Um, and also the uh, Quakers, which brought the Reformation movement to the Americas. So within this, 
as I've been going along uh, through it, there's a couple of things which sprang to mind, some things which I noticed. One, that there'd always been Bible believers wanting to move away from political power, not concerned about social um, anything, not the doctrines of man. But there'd always been elements of truth, people wanting to recognize what the Bible said uh, for themselves. And But many seems like more often than not, such movements tend to get quashed, um, either through death, persecution, or even just general assimilation, um, just tending to go along with the flow. And also in that, the movements tended to kind of die down, just kind of, you know, despite radical starts, they tended to just kind of just fade into the background and just became part of the status quo, um, not in a, always in a positive way. When I first joined the UPC, there was an article I read in the Pentecostal Truth. Um, it was written by, I think it was either Bishop Dallas or uh, Brother Turley, and it mentions that how a, a church denomination, an organization, within about 70 years or a few generations, it tends to move away from its initial ideals, from its um, initial um, starts. And it always uh, stuck with me, noting that, you know, the, could this happen to the UPC? Could this happen to the apostolic movements? So, and I'm at, you know, we looked at the 19th century. We looked at how um, revival principles started to come into place. And quite frankly, it seemed like that was going to be that was going to be just another flash in the pan, something else that was going to be likely to die down. Um, but we came. To, so now we come to the year 1900. 1900s, the start of the 20th century, being a radical century in itself. So within the year 1900, we had uh, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin um, developing a new uh, form of travel. We had the um, a, no a novel by Frank L. Baum, um, you might have heard of it, called The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, published in 1900. And a bubonic plague, um, just all plagues, always with the plagues, isn't it? Monkeypox being the latest thing, but uh, this one was just now the uh, Spanish flu. But um, but generally, the um, this is starting to become a there's starting to be changes within radical society, and likewise within the church, uh, something else was about to kick off. So we had we got uh, Charles Parham, who's a who was a Methodist minister um, who was in who was born in Iowa, moved over to Kansas, and much like. Um, some people before, he'd grown disillusioned with the church in general, kind of um, frustrated by its um, its limitations. And so he moved, despite being a Methodist preacher, he actually um, chose to go independent. And in time, he actually opened up a divine healing home to, uh, su to support um, a, a movement there. So born in 1873, died in 1929 back to him later but um so you open up a divine healing home um which is called bethel people getting healed and everything just another kind of church another another thing not not anything particularly out of the ordinary i suppose um within america at that time but nonetheless it's actually proved to be um have proved to have some kind of measure of success so even just within a couple of years he actually opened up a small bible school and it's going to give a quick plug to bible school if you have if you've not been before um, there's a table at the back, and we're privi privileged to have the dean uh, in attendance. Um, not today, but um, she comes here. Um, yeah, it's a, so yeah, it's always great to uh, get a good biblical grounding. But he opened up a small Bible school in October of 1900. Now, those of you which have uh, been to any kind of educational place, think about all the kind of textbooks that you have. You drag along maths books and language books and all these kind of things. Um, chugging along in your backpack. You'd have liked this one. There's only literally just one textbook that the Bible school used, the Bible. So, um, and so the, they were reading through this diligently, um, seeking the scriptures. And they came to a conundrum, a problem. What is this about the Holy Spirit? Was it just something for the people of times past? Was it something um, that's any believer just had, just as a result of just professing a faith, faith in Christ. So, like any good teacher, he set their assignments, and uh, Charles Parham went off to uh, preach somewhere else. Um, this was in uh, December 1900. 
So he came back just before they had their watch night service. Watch night services we still have them to this day, um, from New Year's Eve to uh, New Year's Day. So just before he he came back and he said, "So what have you found out?" The students all came. All of them came to the same conclusion that evidence of the Holy Spirit was um, by evidence of um, speaking in tongues. Coming to that conclusion, just like just like um. Thing is, things about humans, we discover something. What do we want to do? We want to try and test it as, um, as ardently as we can, either in science or within scripture. So they ardently sought it. There was a lady there named um, Agnes Osman who um, wanted to be a missionary to China. Uh, we touched last, last time on how James Hudson Taylor, he wanted to be a missionary to China and how he, he had to learn the Chinese language. I mentioned how difficult it is. But she wanted to go there. So she asked for hands to be laid on her. Could she be able to? Would she be able to be a missionary to China? So then, in December, sorry, in January first, nineteen oh one, right at the start of the century, Agnes Osman received the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. This was now something what that was going to now just start to transform the the state, the country. Always think about this now, just like kind of as a fuse going throughout history. Little flickers here and there, and now this is about to like really kick off. Charles Parham, rather than keep it to himself, rather than just keep it to his group, he immediately went out, started telling people about it. Within time, just within the next couple of days, um, about half of the group um, they started to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, so now this the Holy Spirit was just like kind of just moving like a massive explosion. Um, it was reported on uh, throughout newspapers. So that's it, the Gutenberg Press. You, the means of communication initially used to be able to print the Bible, to, be, um, to produce changes, um, reformationist principles. Now it's being used to proclaim Pentecost. Newsstands, corner shops, um, little newsboys saying, extra, extra, read all about it, Pentecost is arrived. Nothing being uh, marked, just, and then what? Thousands of people, hundreds of people, tens of meetings coming. Uh, he went throughout the state, went throughout Kansas, Texas, Illinois, traveling the country. There have been other groups within history, but they tend to um, just kind of keep themselves to themselves. I think of the Albigenses within France. Um, and as a result of their, you know, just kind of their hermitness, eventually the movement was quashed. This was, it was taking the movement on the road and became effective. So um, miracles were happening, people being filled en masse throughout the place. And eventually, um, he set up another uh, Bible school within Texas. I'm going to come on to that in a bit, but that will bring us on to our key passage in Acts chapter 2. So this was coming back now to what the church had um, started with, in that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, when January 1st, 1901 was fully come, when people praying in the streets was fully come, when people just walking through their campus was fully come, the people kept their heart in accordance with God. And then suddenly what happens? The, back then there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. There were testimonies within that revival of people hearing like a hurricane, people seeing uh, the like flames above people, shimmering lights. So even if this might be just like a regular church service, within the spirit realm, God is moving in a massive way. Not just filling that one person, but filling the entire room. And he appeared unto them, cloven tongues as of fire, and he sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is how the church started, and now it's starting up again. So I'm going to take an interlude now, going over to the other side of the world. Um, so, and our story starts with a man named Joseph Jenkins in Wales. Wales of all places. I've not touched on Wales like, at all throughout um, church history. I've touched on the British Isles generally. But Wales, great country. It supplies our, <laughs> it supplies our fair city with uh, rivers of clean water. And now in 1904, there were going to be rivers of living water coming out of Wales. So, uh, my man, Joseph Jenkins, incidentally, coincidentally, um, died in the same year as uh, Charles Parham. 
born in. I think someone just um, kind of fell on the keyboard there. But uh, <laughs> come, Mr. Red, thank you. <laughs> um, and he's the son of a miner. Next to this, turn of the century, it would have, wouldn't have been unusual for someone to follow in their father's footsteps and for, um, for Joseph to have also been a miner. But he felt the call of God on his life um, early on. He felt the need, he felt the core, the passion for revival. Um, and he was used by God um, quite, quite effectively from an early age. Um, and he, he, was, he went to speak within, um, within communities. He first started off um, preaching in Liverpool uh, to Welsh-speaking communities. And for those of you so inclined, he actually preached just around the corner from Everton football grounds. Um, I was shocked. I didn't even know Everton was in, in Liverpool, to be honest. I honestly always, honestly always thought Everton was like down in like London somewhere. That's how clueless I am about football. So, But uh, yeah, clearly he was um, successful there, and he eventually passed a church in a new key, Cardiganshire, within, which is in towards the west of Wales. And he, like Charles Parham, he, he had frustrations with the complacency of uh, church life. And so he, he set up meetings to try and encourage people to have a, a deeper uh, spiritual life. Um, he read... Um, and one time he was reading um, biographies, and he read one by Dwight L. Moody. We touched on him last time. This is how effectively someone can minister that even if their initial ministry is gone, how their spirits, um, their movements can uh, still continue. Um, so from reading, from reading it, he um, continued to, um, to seek God in an earnest way. Um, one historian wrote that during one, um, a particularly powerful time of prayer, he said he prayed as never before, and one night in particular, he lost all sense of time. Having laid hold upon God, he continued to wrestle until a blessing was received, which equipped him with power from on high. Getting up from his knees, he became aware of a blue flame, which almost enshrouded him rhythmically, off and on for some time. It was an experience he never forgot, and only could be taken as a visible sign of the intense spiritual communion he had joined, um, he enjoyed with God. So, and just a few weeks later, having received this Holy Ghost experience, he went to preach to his uh, congregation. And he, he preached a message on 1 John 5, 4. But after he preached that, there was a, a, a young lady who stood up um, named Flory Evans. And she said, and uh, Beth, I'm going to apologize as well. She said, Irif in garu yesu grist am hol galan. I love the Lord Jesus with all of my heart. When she said that, there was an, kind of this ushering, this weight upon the congregation. Then suddenly there was crying. And then suddenly the Holy Ghost Spirit moved mightily within that place. And this is um, dubbed the start of the, uh, the Welsh revival. After that, just like Parham, he took it on the road. This wasn't something that was, they were keeping to themselves. Um, but then throughout the country, without the, throughout those particular areas, hundreds of people were coming um, to receive the, the, coming back to Christ, having this great Holy Spirit experience. And then independently, um, also uh, within Wales, um, I have a, another preacher, one named Evan Roberts. I love that name. It's the Welshiest Welsh name that ever Welsh. But... Uh, <laughs> So, um, so this guy, um, um, born in Loughborough, um, on the um, near uh, Carmarthenshire, and born into a Methodist family. Well, this guy, he he actually started off as a miner, but he'd always carry his Bible around within his um, lunch breaks, any spare moment. He'd always be diligently see, um, reading the Word of God. Man of my own heart, he was um, always studying it. Um, wasn't satisfied with just working in the mines and decided to go into the ministry. And he had visions of uh, revival. Sorry, this isn't going on there. Um, he, he had a, a deep passion for us. I can read there. He, he used to pray regularly from 1 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock. I'm going to bed at like 1 o'clock at the time, well, most of the time. But uh, yeah, so pray for that time, have a little nap, and then get ready for his, um, get ready for his day. Then one time he had a vision of um, God just stretching out his hand over Wales. And he had this vision, this desire for 100,000 people 
within Wales to get saved. Likewise, just like Joseph Jenkins, he had a Holy Spirit experience, as I said, in, independently um, moving. And he had this desire just to be um, bent before God, to be broken down, um, denying himself. And he, likewise, he um, went throughout the country preaching this great message of revival. And it is actually estimated that about 100,000 people did actually turn to Christ, that communities were changed, um, pubs were closed down, crime dropped, families were restored. As a result of um, th these two men's ministry, Wales uh, was transformed uh, throughout that time. Truly, God was working in such a mighty way. I always have to think now, this, this, was, starting at the, this was at the 20th century now, and a lot of times, if you've, uh, if you've been in a church for any length of time, the word uh, dunamis is used within scripture to represent power, um, and we get the word dynamite from us. I'm going to go one step further now. This was an ex explosion of the Holy Spirit moving, not just in one little explosion which might have knocked down a building or whatever, but this was now an explosion which was transforming the geopolitical landscape. This was um, transforming lives. People which even hadn't seen the initial outpouring, they were still being affected no matter how far away. So yeah, the Spirit of God went nuclear. I want you to remember that now. This has been in the 20th century. So, and I'm now going to um, take our journey uh, right back to the Americas. So when we left off, um, Charles Parham, he'd opened up a Bible college within Texas. Start of the century, America, segregation. So while Charles Parham was uh, speaking to his white students, um, black African-Americans were um, sat outside. One particular one, uh, William Seymour, ardently studying the Word of God. Um, and Charles Parham saw something within him. And so Charles Parham wanted him to speak, um, to preach to African-Americans. Even though the, the fact that, um, that he hadn't received the Holy Spirit himself, he was still determined to preach the message out, even with that crumb, that nugget that he had, that he wanted to um, give it out to others. Uh, a lady heard him preach while he was in Texas and invited him to preach into uh, downtown LA, uh, Los Angeles, California, to, um, to continue to spread this Holy Spirit message. So and when he got there, and this is always going to be a discouragement from any preacher, from everyone, anyone wants to go into the ministry, he was rejected, preached a few messages, and what did he find? That they'd actually locked him out of the church. <laughs> Great. Was he going to be dejected? Yes. Would he, would he have been discouraged? Perhaps. But was he stopped? No, he continued. That the guy he was um, staying with, uh, a local janitor, that janitor had um, went to occasional uh, prayer meetings. And so William Seymour went to preach at those prayer meetings. Then in 1906, um, the guy that he was staying with got filled with the Holy Spirit. Even though he, um, Seymour hadn't um, received it himself, the message he was preaching, he got um, the Holy Spirit started to move again, and then just a few days later, he did as well. So even just this, just while just at a, a cell group, just at someone's house, a mighty move of God was happening, and now hundreds of people were coming, um, filling up the streets just to this person's house. What are they going to do with all these people? That, so what they do? They, um, they found a a derelict building. It had once been used as a as an African Episcopalian church, um, and it had um, been quite derelict. It had um, been destroyed by fire, um, pretty much. So, the, but nonetheless, this building at 312 Azusa Street, um, they managed to find, managed to rent it, and this was like nothing else. This was like literally 24/7. I mean that in the true sense of the word. Every hour, every day, there was always something going on there. People praising, people worshipping, people preaching. Mighty, mighty move of God within this, this place. Not being uh, confined to any particular region or anything. The Holy Spirit was moving uh, throughout the nation. And once again, the, uh, the press got involved, uh, journalists. The, the local... I forgot it there. Yeah, so it's... Um, so the newspapers, they spoke about it having a weird babel of tongues, a new set of fanatics um, breaking loose. Um, some of the other uh, headlines at the time, I'm going to quote because I love some of these now. 
Negroes and whites give themselves over to strange outbursts of zeal. Um, crazed girls in arms of black men. So, um, just to quote, <laughs> amen. You know what? Glad you said that. The, um, the um, journalist, he said that there were much cries of amen and hallelujah and praise the Lord. The singing was also different as loud, boisterous numbers were sung in place of the conventional hymns. I was shocked to my Sunday school roots as the people <laughs> left their seats and began jumping up and down and running around the church building. The worship was shockingly different, unlike anything I'd ever seen. So literally thousands of people just within this building, just always coming in and out, just um, working, um, with God working in such a mighty way. Um, there's reference to it saying there's shaking such as the early Quakers had, and which the old Methodist called the jerks. No instrument that God can use is rejected on account of colour or dress or lack of education. This, this was the church of 1906, ahead of its time. Such unity there. Blacks and whites together, white professors, black laundry women, rich and poor. Every division which uh, mankind puts upon itself arrays there within the presence of God. Um, not even pictured there, there are also um, people of Asian and Mexican descent also, people um, of all over. The Holy Spirit moving might mightily um, at that time, starting a new movement entirely. A, new, a movement which had been there within Scripture the whole time, but now just finally picking up. A movement which actually precipitated, the started um, a great move which started to encompass the whole world. This was the, no, the fulfillment of the promise of Acts 2, 38 and 39, that Peter said unto them, who was them? The Cretes, the Persians, um, Romans, people, North Africans, people from every corner then of the known world, all coming together to find out what is this, what do we do, what is all this about? But he said to them, repent, even if they'd had their Sunday school roots, even if they'd had their if they thought they were following Christ in their, what they believed to be right, they still need to accept Christ fully for themselves to turn their lives around and to be baptised. What? In the next... Baptise every one of you in what? The name of Peter? Name of Paul? Name of John? Name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit? In the name of what? Again? For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why the name of Jesus? With the name under heaven, whereby what? We're saved, you must be saved. Thank you. And promises unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off. That's what like Jesus was saying. Not just Jerusalem, not just Judea, not just Samaria, but upon all the world, across space, across time, everyone, everyone within Throughout all time, the Spirit was going to be published um, there. <laughs> yes. It's for everyone. This, Peter, he touched on it earlier as well. Is that, he said that this was that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that the Spirit was going to be poured out upon all flesh. Uh, this was that which was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, that with stammering lips and another tongue, that he was going to be speaking to his people. This is that which is spoken of by Jesus, that out of our bellies would flow rivers of living water. This is that which is spoken of by Jesus, that who's not going to leave us comfortless, but he's going to send his spirit to come for us. We've seen how the church was unified. If you remember, the, the term Catholic means universal, Catholicos. Here we see the church actually universal now, reaching out uh, for everyone. So the church now is actually truly Catholic. The church was orthodox. It was following what scripture was saying rather than the um, terms of the world. The church was um, Anabaptist. Why? Because they, they believed that baptism was for those who made a conscious decision to follow Christ, not just um, to not put children or babies. That was going to be um, not, clued, not clued up to us. The church was following Lutheran principles, looking what the scripture said for itself and adhering to us. The church was Puritan desiring the church to be purified, wanting to go back uh, to its roots. The church was Methodist, looking meticulously at what Scripture says and following it. The church became Baptist, 
believing in full immersion rather than just the sprinkling. The church, a lot of the organizations, they tend to just build on what had been come, come on before, what the church had gone on before, and then try and build off that. Despite the fact that adopting all these nuggets of truth, which before time, that had a form of godliness but denied the power, rather than actually building on top of that, they actually took it right back to the beginning. So rather than actually try to identify themselves as anything else, they went back to the beginning and identifying themselves, following the teaching of the apostles, with the Pentecostal believing, becoming apostolic, Pentecostal. And this, this movement now, not confined to any one country, this was truly moving forward, moving um, from South America to India, to Europe, uh, Philippines, Africa, and literally just 10 years after um, the Holy Ghost movement um, started within, um, within um, California, um, even in, independently within Jamaica, it actually started up there with the Holy Ghost spirit there in 1916. So after all that, what, the, what happens next? Church history continues today. We see um, great men such as uh, Brother Turley, Brother Campbell, Brother Sappleton, uh, giants of God, as, wor- as worthy of um, place in church history as any other, as just as much as the um, Pope, Pope Gregory, as just as much as Luther, all these um, men and women of God, um, with the power, under the power of the Holy Spirit, desiring a return to what um, God had desired, God desired it. And likewise, just as Dwight L. Moody said, we all have a place within the church of God. The, the world can be transformed uh, through us, us average people. We don't need to be able to necessarily lead a massive revival. We don't necessarily need to transform nations. We're just speaking to one person. I said, Dwight L. Moody, he ended up in, impacting someone else, just, um, just through, through someone else just reading his book. Who could we impact that could end up uh, transforming the world? We just need to um, continue to persevere, desi- um, desiring a great move of God. Throughout church history, I've not been able to touch on everyone. Sometimes the uh, stories have been lost to history because newspapers, historians, they deem who's important. We just uh, need to carry on desiring to make moves of God however we can. There's only one newspaper article that we need to be concerned about, the Lamb's Book of Life. Make sure we've got a little asterisk next to, next to it, it's just, we just um, have a footnote saying, um, well done, good and faithful servants. So to sum up then, the same experience which started the church began again, started the 20th century and started a move of God unlike any other, it became one of the um, fastest growing movements, which is as I said, it um, erased every barrier which, um, which man has drawn up. It has brought out on a worldwide scale. People turned to God with new passion. This, was, this wasn't just like going to su- Sunday just on a um, 11 till 1, maybe Thursdays, um, 7.30 to 8 now. These are people desiring to have God greatly within their own lives outside of the church building. As I think it was Don Dre's, they spoke on once, and that's this isn't the church. We are the church. And our people were having church themselves, wherever they were. And that hint, history now continues to be written. This was just, um, just over 100 years ago. God is still moving. God hasn't just accepted the status quo of what people have said. We too can be history makers. We've been looking at other people um, creating history. But God can use us to create history in our own ways. God bless you all. <laughs>